Good morning, class. So today we're going to be going over Chapter 16, Cardiovascular Emergencies. So pathophysiology applies fundamental knowledge to the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion to patient assessment and management. Medicine applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Cardiovascular, anatomy, signs, symptoms, and management of chest pain and cardiac arrest. Anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, assessment, and management of acute coronary syndrome, or ACS. Angina pectoris, myocardial infarction, or MI, or heart attack. Aortic aneurysm, dissection. Thromboembolism, heart failure, hypertensive emergencies. So introduction. Cardiovascular disease has been the leading killer of Americans since 1900. Accounts for one out of every three deaths. EMS can help reduce deaths by encouraging healthy lifestyle, getting regular exercise, uh, eating nutritious diets, um, early access to medical care, more CPR training of lay people or, or just regular bystanders, increased use of evolving technology and dispatch and cardiac arrest response. So when people call 911 where they're actually given instructions on, on what to do and how they could help before uh, EMS arrives on scene, starting CPR, trying to see if we can open an airway, things of those nature. EMS can help reduce deaths by public asset access to defibrillation devices. So as you guys might see more and more in public areas or public buildings, there's going to be a lot more AEDs around, especially schools, um, hospitals, they're going to have one every almost every classroom or every 50 to 100 feet, recognizing need for advanced life support or ALS. The use of cardiac specialty centers when they are available. So if somebody's actually having a cardiac event or chest pain, they're gonna be directed to go to those specialty centers or specialty hospitals. So in this county, we have SVMH or Salinas, Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital or CHOMP Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula down in Monterey. Anatomy and physiology, heart's job is to pump blood to supply oxygen and rich red blood cells to tissues divided into left and right sides and also upper left and lower left and upper right and lower right. So you have the atria up top and the ventricles down at the bottom. So as I'm sure you guys have seen this multiple times, so you have your vena cava right here, your vena cava up here, so this is going to be your superior vena cava. It's going to take blood from the upper part of your body and your inferior vena cava is going to take blood from the lower part of your body. And it's going to send them both to the right atrium, which is going to go right down through here to the right ventricle. You also have your, you're going to have four valves in your heart as well. So you're going to have your tricuspid valve right in between your right atrium and your left ventricle. And then you're going to have your... Uh, pulmonary valve as well so pulmonic valve it's gonna be right here so it's between the right ventricle and your your lungs so it's gonna take blood back into your lungs get it oxygenated and then it's gonna come back in um, to the to the left side of your atrium and then it's gonna go through another valve your mitral valve and then back down to your to your ventricles to your left ventricle, excuse me. Okay, so one way valves keep blood flowing in the proper direction. So you have four valves in your heart your tricuspid, pulmonary, mitral, and aortic. And the purpose of this is to um, keep blood flowing uh, in the proper area and not backflow it. And if any of these valves are damaged, it could cause CHF or, or a backflow or backlog. And this is what happens in CHF or congestive heart failure. And this is why people get blood or, excuse me, blood or fluid in their lungs. Aorta, main, body's main artery, receives blood ejected from the left ventricle. So this shows you kind of the route of how blood flows through the heart. So you got your vena cavas, it's going to go through your right atrium, and it's going to go down 
to your uh, right ventricle, and it's going to go to your back to your lungs, get oxygenated, and then it's going to go back into your left atrium, and it's going to be oxygenated blood at this point. It's going to pop down to your left ventricle, and then it's going to go out through your aortas, so back up top, and then back down to your lower body. Okay, heart's electrical system controls heart rate and coordinates atria and ventricles. Automaticity allows spontaneous contraction without a stimulus from a nerve source. If impulses come from the SA node or the sinoatrial node, the other myocardial cells will contract. If no impulse arrives, the other cells are capable of creating their own impulses and stimulating a contraction. So this is your electrical conduction system of the heart. So your SA node is going to be primary conductor of your heart. And it goes at a rate of 60 to 100 beats a minute. If that fails, it's going to go to your AV node. Okay, and that's about 40 to 60 beats a minute. And then it's going to go down to your bundle of his. Okay. And then it's going to branch off into your left bundle branch and your right bundle branch and then you have your Perkin G fibers right here okay. so the lower your impulses go in your heart for your electrical conduction system is the lower your heart rate is going to be so autonomic nervous system ANS controls involuntary activities the ANS has two parts sympathetic nervous system the fight or flight system and the parasympathetic nervous system slows various body bodily functions. The myocardium must have a continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients to pump blood. Increased oxygen demand by myocardium is supplied by dilation or widening of coronary arteries. Stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected with each ventricle contraction. Coronary arteries are blood vessels that supply heart supply blood to the heart muscle. Coronary arteries start at the first part of the aorta, the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. So you guys see down here, you have your, your right coronary artery and then also your left coronary artery. So arteries supply oxygen to different parts of the body, the right and left carotid, the right and left subclavian which is going to be near your near your shoulder, your brachial, your radial, and ulnar, right and left iliac, right and left femoral, anterior and posterior tibial and peronal. Arterioles and capillaries are smaller vessels. Capillaries connect arterioles to venules. Venules are the smallest branches of the veins, vena cava return blood to the heart, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Blood consists of red blood cells which carry oxygen, white blood cells which fight infection, platelets which help blood to clot, plasma which is uh, the fluid cells float in. So you guys should all know what the difference is, um, uh, the types of cells in the blood and what it consists of and what they do for the body. So blood pressure is a force of circulating blood against arter artery walls. Systolic blood pressure, the maximum pressure generated by left ventricle. Diastolic blood pressure, the pressure against artery walls with, while the vent left ventricle is at rest. So when you guys take a blood pressure, the first number is going to be your systolic blood pressure and the second number is going to be your diastolic blood pressure. So, so 120 over 80, 120 is going to be your systolic, 80 is going to be your diastolic. Uh, pulse is felt when blood passes through an artery during systole, systole. Peripheral pulses can be felt in the extremities. Central pulses felt near the body's trunk. So a central pulse would be like carotid or femoral. Peripheral pulse would be either a radial pulse or a pedal pulse. And so here's all your all your pulses right here. So your carotid. When you guys are going to check for an unresponsive patient, if you guys don't have a carotid, you're probably going to start doing CPR and your femoral. So that these two are going to be your, your central pulses. Okay, so femoral right in the groin, brachial in the uh, 
upper arm, and that's where you guys are going to check for a pediatric. Radial in the wrist, posterior tibial near the ankle, and dorsalis pedis is going to be right on top of your foot. And you're going to have one more right behind your knee, uh, the popolital artery as well. So cardiac output is the volume of blood that passes through the heart in one minute. Heart rate times volume of blood ejected with each contraction is you're going to be your stroke volume. Perfusion is a constant flow of oxygenated blood to tissues. Requirements of good perfusion. If perfusion fails, cellular and eventually patient death will occur. So pathophysiology. Chest pain usually stems from ischemia, which is decreased blood flow. So this is a good word for you guys to remember because they're going to use it in both chest pain and also uh, when you guys are having a stroke. Ischemic heart disease involves a decreased blood flow to one or more portions of the heart. If blood flow is not restored, the tissue dies. Okay, so atherosclerosis is a buildup of calcium and cholesterol in arteries. It can cause occlusion of arteries. Fatty material accumulates with the age. So this is why we encourage people to eat healthy and not eat uh, junk food or fast food because it's going to build up a uh, plaque in the arteries. So you see plaque builds up right here. It's going to narrow the arteries and eventually if you get enough plaque in there it's going to occlude the artery and result in ischemia or reduce blood flow to the heart and could cause a heart attack. So. You got your normal blood flow through here, and your plaque is coming in and reducing the blood flow. A thromboembolism is a blood clot floating through blood vessels. If a clot lodges in the coronary artery, acute myocardial infarction, AMI results. Coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death in the United States. Controllable AMI risk factors, cigarette smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, High blood glucose level, diabetes, lack of exercise, and obesity. So this is all stuff that we can control. Um, stay away from smoking. Get your blood pressure under control because that could also result in, in possibly having a stroke as well. So uncontrollable AMI risk factors. Older age, family history, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, race, ethnicity, and being male. So it's important to know also your family history because this can be make you more prone to, to whatever your parents, your grandparents, uh, or your ancestors have. So if you've had a couple of people in your family die of, of heart attacks or strokes, it's gonna make you more susceptible to those, those diseases in the future. Acute coronary syndrome or ACS is caused by myocardial ischemia. Angina pectoris, acute myocardial infarction. Angina pectoris occurs when the heart's need for oxygen exceeds supply. Crushing or squeezing pain does not usually lead to death or permanent heart damage. should be taken as a serious warning sign. So anybody you believe is suffering from angina should probably go to a STEMI center or a heart center to get checked out. Unstable angina. In response to fewer stimuli than normal, stable angina is relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. Treat angina patients like AMI patients. So remember we talked about stable angina and unstable angina. So stable angina is people can usually predict it if they walk upstairs and they get some chest pain. And all they have to do is just sit down for a couple minutes or take some nitroglycerin and it'll be fine. Unstable angina kind of comes and goes and not really able to to get rid of it after relaxing for a few minutes or taking some nitroglycerin. And that's that could lead into a more serious condition or a heart attack. So AMI pain signals actual death of cells and heart muscle. Once dead, cells cannot be revived. Clot busting and thromb thrombolytic drugs or angioplasty within the few, first few hours prevent damage. Immediate transport is necessary, is essential, excuse me. Signs and symptoms of AMI, weakness, nausea, sweating, chest pain, discomfort, or pressure, lower jaw, arm, back, abdomen, abdomen, or neck pain, irregular heartbeat and syncope, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, pink frothy sputum, sudden death. Pink frothy sputum is also another good indication of possible CHF. 
AMI pain differs from angina pain, not always due to exertion, lasts 30 minutes to several hours, not always relieved by rest or nitroglycerin. AMI patients may not rela realize they are experiencing a heart attack. So if you give a, a person with chest pain um, nitroglycerin or aspirin and it's not relieving their pain, it's vital to get getting them to the hospital and getting checked out by a doctor because it could be could be a heart attack, most likely. AMI and cardiac can promise physical findings. Fear, nausea, poor circulation, faster, regular bradycardic pulse, decreased normal or elevated blood pressure, normal or rapid and labored respirations. Patients expressed feelings of impending doom. So this is another serious sign that something could be going wrong. As a patient expressed feelings of pending doom, it could mean that they are experiencing a heart attack. Three serious consequences of AMI, sudden death resulting from cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, congestive heart failure, or CHF. Dysrhythmia, heart rhythm abnormalities, premature ventricular contractions, or PVCs, tachycardia, bradycardia, ventricular tachycardia, or VTAC, ventricular fibrillation, or VFib. Defibrillation restores cardiac arrhythmias, or cardiac rhythms, can save lives, initiate CPR until a defibrillator is available. A systole, absence of all electrical activity, reflects a long period of ischemia. Nearly all patients will die. So I'm sure you guys have seen it in movies where you have basically just a flat line. We call it flatlining. And that's that's what a systole is. A person has no pulse and not even electrical activity in their heart. So cardiogenic shock, often caused by heart attack. Heart lacks power to force enough blood through circulatory system. Inadequate oxygen to body tissues causes organs to malfunction. Often caused by a heart attack, heart lacks the power to pump. Recognize shock in its early stages. Congestive heart failure often occurs a few days following heart attack. Increased heart rate and enlargement of left ventricle no longer make up for the decreased heart function. Lungs become congested with fluid, may cause dependent edema, which means uh, fluid down in the legs. Hypertensive emergencies, systolic pressure greater than 180. Common symptoms, sudden severe headache, strong bounding pulse, ringing in the ears. So. When you see anybody with a with a pressure of more than 180, it's probably a good idea to ask them if they if they do have a history of hypertension or if they take any medications for that. Sudden severe headache because the pressure is so high, it's going to put so much force and pressure on the the arteries in the head. And if one of those arteries in the head bursts, it could be a, a stroke. And so it's important to tell these people that they need to get checked out immediately or they need to talk to their doctor and let them know. So common symptoms, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, warm skin, dry or moist, nosebleed, alter mental status, sudden pulmonary edema or flash edema. That's what we call it as well. If untreated, it can lead to a stroke or dissecting aortic aneurysm. Transport patients quickly and safely. Consider ALS assistance. Aortic aneurysm is weakness in the wall of the aorta, susceptible to rupture. Di dissecting aneurysm occurs when inner layers of aorta become separated. Primary cause, uncontrolled hypertension. <laughs> okay, so these are the signs and symptoms to be aware of when you're when you're treating someone with chest pain. So AMI versus dissecting aortic aneurysm. Okay, so if somebody has um, gradual onset of of pain, tightness, or pressure, increases with time, may may kind of go back and forth. Substernal, which means uh, back is rarely involved. Excuse me, substernal, just below the sternum. And peripheral pulses are going to be equal. With a dissecting aneurysm, it's going to be sharp or tearing. It's going to be most likely pinpoint. Uh, it's not going to radiate anywhere. It's going to be 
probably in the back as well, right between the shoulder blades. And there's going to be also a blood pressure discrepancy between the arms. So if you take a, take a blood pressure cuff and take a blood pressure on the right side, and you think it might be a possible aortic aneurysm, uh, you're going to go ahead and take a blood pressure on the other arm. And oh, another good way to know is it's going to be abrupt. It's going to be sudden uh, chest pain as well. Okay, so signs and symptoms again, very sudden chest pain. It's not going to come on gradually. It's going to come on basically full force down here. So different blood pressures as well. Transport patients quickly and safely. They need to see a surgeon. They need to see a doctor. Get that fixed. Otherwise, they could die. So scene size up. Scene safety. Ensure the scene is safe. Follow standard precautions. Make sure you got everything. Um, all the standard precautions that you're going to need for each call. Nature of illness, NOI. Obtain clues from dispatch, the scene, patient, family members, bystanders. So you're always searching searching and trying to find out what you're walking into. You try not to walk in a, in a calls blind. Sometimes it happens, but most of the time you want to be wary. You want to know what's going on first before you walk into something. So primary assessment, form a general impression. What's your general impression when you walk up to a patient? Is the patient sitting up? Is the patient laying down? Is the patient uh, unresponsive? So if unresponsive, not breathing, begin CPR and call for AD. Airway and breathing. You got to make sure the airway is open first, right? And then, then they're breathing. Rate rhythm, tidal volume. Then you're going to check their circulation. What's the rate rhythm and quality? So oxygen saturation less than 95%. Apply oxygen with non-rebreather mask at 15 liters a minute. Not breathing or inadequate breathing, 100% oxygen with BVM, pulmonary edema, BVM, or CPAP. If the patient's alert and can protect their own airway, you're going to do a CPAP. If the patient's unresponsive and can't protect their own airway, you're going to put an OPA or MPA and go ahead and bag them or BVM. Circulation, you're going to check pulse, skin, capillary refill. Consider treatment for cardiogenic shock, transport decision. Decision based on ability to stabilize life threats during primary assessment. Okay. Transport in a stress relieving manner. So, transport decision depends on do you think you could stay in play? You could kind of figure out or treat some of the, the issues going on with that patient, or is it something beyond your scope of practice? Does that person need to see a, see a doctor right away? Okay. Or load and go. So history taking, investigate the chief complaint, chest pain, difficulty breathing, obtain a sample history from unresponsive, or excuse me, from a responsive patient, use OPQRST. So for difficulty breathing, we're going to use paste mnemonic. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into respiratory calls. Yeah. So remember, you guys have to know these questions. So onset, when, the, when did the problem begin? Provocation slash palliation, does anything make it better or worse? Quality. Ask them to describe the pain. Is the pain sharp? Is the pain dull? Is it tearing? Region, radiation, where's the pain located? Can you point to the, where the pain is for me? Severity, how bad is the pain on a one to 10 scale? Timing, how long the pain lasts um, when it's present? Usually the onset's gonna tell you how long it's been going on for. Okay, so physical examination, focus on cardiac and respiratory system. Circulation, respirations, vital signs, measure and record the patient's vital signs. If available, use pulse oximetry. Reassessment, reassess vital signs at least every five minutes or when patient's condition changes significantly. Sudden cardiac arrest is always a risk. Cardiac arrest occurs, perform CPR immediately until an AED is available. So, Always know where your equipment is in your rig. Always know where your equipment is in your jump bag when you're on scene. Sometimes patients code right in front of you and you're going to have to start CPR. You're going to have to have your AED handy. You're going to have to know how to use it. I've had a few patients who have coded right in front of me. You guys have to be able to know where all your equipment is and be able to get to it in under 30 seconds. Reassess your interventions. Provide rapid patient transport. Communication and documentation. 
Emergency medical care for chest pain or discomfort. Ensure proper position of comfort. So when you get a patient on your gurney, you got to ask them, do you feel better sitting up? Do you feel better laying down? What's better for you? Give oxygen if indicated. If you think patient's having shortness of breath or chest pain and you think oxygen's going to help, go ahead and give them some oxygen. Depending on protocol, prepare to assist Administer low-dose aspirin or baby aspirin and assist with prescribed nitroglycerin. Make sure you guys know the contraindications and indications for both aspirin and nitro and the doses and the routes. Aspirin effects. Prevents blood clots from forming or getting bigger. So if patients already having chest pain, that most likely means they have some type of clot. And this is what aspirin does. It's antiplatelet and prevents clots from getting bigger. So 81 milligrams chewable tablets. So a recommended dose can be 162 milligrams, two tablets to 324 milligrams or four tablets. So in our county, we give four tablets at one time. And then we go on a nitroglycerin. So nitroglycerin available forms, sublingual pill, sublingual spray, skin patch applied to chest. So we carry a pill and we also carry um, we don't carry skin patches, but we carry um, nitro paste, which is basically a skin patch. So mechanism of action, relaxes blood vessels. And so it's a vasodilator, increases blood flow and oxygen supply to the heart. Decreases workload of the heart, dilates blood vessels. Side effects, severe headache, change in pulse rate. Contraindications, remember these. So solid blood pressure, less than 100. Head injury, use of ED drugs within 24 hours. Maximum prescribed dose has already been given, usually three doses. So somebody's already taken three doses before you get there. And you're not gonna give them any more without uh, medical direction. Or you're gonna call, call the hospital and ask them if you give more. Remember what's in your scope of practice. Remember what you can give and how many can you give. So administering nitroglycerin. Ensure medication is not expired or contaminated. Ensure medication is prescribed for patient. Wear gloves. So remember your six rights for administering drugs. You always want to make sure your medication is not expired. Ensure your medication is prescribed for that patient. Just because... The patient's brother has prescribed nitroglycerin for himself. You're not going to give that nitroglycerin for your patient. So cardiac monitoring. For an EKG to be reliable and useful, electrodes must be placed in consistent positions. Basic principles should be followed to minimize artifact in the signal. Artifact. ECG tracing that is a result of interference. So guiding principles may need to shave body hair, especially for the people who have a lot of hair on their chest. The electrodes are not going to stick, so we always carry razors with us. So rub electrode site with alcohol swab before application, attach electrodes to EKG cables before placement, and confirm your electrode placement. Make sure it's in the right area. Make sure they're, they're in the right spot for each electrode. It even tells you on the electrode It'll say LL or RL. So RL is going to be your right leg, LL is going to be your left leg. Or RA and LA, right arm and left arm. Make sure the right arm's on the right arm and the left arm's on the left arm. You'd be surprised on how often people mess that up. So there's a picture of it's going to be your four lead placement. Okay. So white over right. So white is going to be on the right side of the body. Okay. So you remember this. White over right. Smoke or black over fire over red. So that's an easy way to remember it. So smoke over fire, white over right. Okay. So when you're doing a 12 lead, you guys are going to have to learn how to put on properly place a 12 lead for your medic okay so you're also going to put on your four lead okay and then you're also going to put on six more leads your v1 through your v6 
This is going to give you a better indication of what's going on in the heart. And it's going to probably tell you wh whether you have a STEMI or not. Make sure you know how to place these. So your V1 and your V2 are going to be your fourth intercostal space. Your V1 is going to be on your right sternal border, and your V2 is going to be your left sternal border. So how I normally put these is I'm going to put these two first, and I'm going to put V4 in the mid-clavicular line, just right below. Okay, And then the V6 is going to just be on the lateral wall. So it's going to be just straight over, straight across, and it's going to be right underneath the armpit on the side of the body. And then your V5 is going to go right in between your V4 and your V6, okay, on the same plane or same li line. And then your V3 is going to be kind of at an angle. It's going to be between your V2 and your V4. So between V2 and V4 is going to be your V3 anterior wall of left ventricle. And that's how you're going to place your 12 lead. Make sure you, you tell your patients before you hit the button for a 12 lead, they got to hold real still because any kind of movement or talking is going to throw these off. Our monitors are very sensitive. So make sure the patient's not moving. Make sure you're not getting any artifact. Once electrodes are in place, switch on the monitor. Print a sample rhythm strip. If strip shows artifact, confirm electrodes are firmly applied and the cable is plugged in. And also make sure the patient's not moving. Any kind of movement or any kind of touching the cables is going to throw artifact into your rhythm. And you're not going to get a clean EKG. Heart surgeries and cardiac assistive devices. Many open heart operations have been performed in the last 30 years. Coronary artery bypass graft. Chest or leg blood vessel is sewn from the aorta to coronary artery beyond the point of obstruction. Percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. A tiny balloon is inflated inside a narrow coronary artery. Patients who have open heart surgeries may or may not have had long, may not have long chest scars. Chest, treat chest pain in a patient who has had any of these procedures is the same. It's a patient who has never had heart surgeries. Others have implanted cardiac pacemakers. So cardiac pacemakers maintain regular cardiac rhythm and rate, deliver electrical impulse through wires in direct contact with the myocardium, implanted under a heavy muscle or a fold of skin in the upper left portion of the chest. So if you guys feel something hard on their chest, upper left, when you guys are putting on electrodes, it's most likely going to be a pacemaker. So don't put the your 12 lead or your 4 leads over, over a pacemaker either. So cardiac pacemakers. Technology is very reliable. Pacemaker malfunction causes syncope, dizziness, or weakness due to an excessively slow heart rate. Transport patients properly. So this is what your pacemaker is going to look like. So if you feel something kind of uh, circle or oval on a chest, and it's going to be really hard. It's going to be your pacemaker on a patient. Mm -hmm. Automatic implantable cardiac defibrillators used by some patients who have survived cardiac arrest due to V-fit. Monitor heart rhythm and shock is needed. Treat chest pain patients with these devices like other patients having an AMI. Electricity is low. It will not affect rescuers. So some people have these. And if they go into a V-fib on their own, they're going to get shocked by their own uh, implanted defibrillators. So external defibrillator vest, a vest built with built-in monitoring electrodes and defibrillation pads worn by the patient. Attached to a monitor, uses high energy shocks. Do not touch the patient if devices warns it's about to deliver a shock. So be careful when you're when you see these. They're they're very rare. I've only seen one in my career so far. Vest should remain in place while CPR is being performed unless it interferes with compressions. Don't take these vests off. Left ventricular assist device, used to enhance the pumping of the left ventricle. Maybe pulsatile or continuous. The patient or family can tell you more about the device. Transport all supplies and battery packs with the patient. So these are getting a little more common as well. Your, your LVADs. 
And the closest specialty center is going to be Stanford or UCSF. So if you guys run on somebody in Monterey County, I think we only have uh, two or three patients that use these in our county. And they're complaining of chest pain. They're probably going to go up to Stanford or UCSF depending on what their symptoms are because it might be an issue with their LVAD. I'm not sure if you guys are old enough to remember uh, George W. Bush. His vice president, Dick Cheney, uh, wears one of these, the LVADs. So cardiac arrest, the complete cessation of cardiac activity, absence of car carotid pulse, was terminal before CPR and external defibrillation were developed in the 1960s. So your automated external defibrillations or your AED analyzes electrical signal signals from heart, identifies V-fib or ventricular fibrillation, administers shock to heart when needed. So these, you're not going to shock a patient who's asystole. So if this monitor recognizes a patient who's in asystole, it's going to tell you to continue CPR after two minutes of compressions. So AED models all require some operator interaction. Most have a computer voice synth synthesizer advising steps to take. Most are semi-automated. So this is another good example of why you guys need to know your equipment. Every AED is different. Make sure you understand the instructions. Make sure you know where the patches go. Make sure you know where to plug it in at. Make sure you know how to turn it on. Make sure you know which button is shock. Advantages of AED use. Quick delivery of shock, easy to operate. ALS providers do not need to be on scene. Remote adhesive pads, safe to use. Larger pad area equals more efficient shocks. Make sure you guys aren't touching the patient or a patient is not in water when you're shocking a patient. Other considerations. Though all cardiac arrest patients should be analyzed, not all require shock. All patients in cardiac arrest should be analyzed with an AED. A systole or flat line equals no electrical activity. So you're going to continue compressions. You're not going to shock that patient. Pulses electrical activity usually refers to a state of cardiac arrest. So basically this is PEA. It looks like you're going to have a rhythm, but there's no pulse. And that's just your electrical activity in your heart still trying to fire. But you're going to have no pulse. And you're going to continue compressions. You're not going to shock that either. So early defibrillation. Few cardiac arrest patients survive outside a hospital without a rapid sequence of events. So your chain of survival is going to be your five events, remember? So early recognition and activation of EMS, immediate bystander CPR, rapid defib, basic and advanced EMS, ALS and post-arrest care. So here are your five links to your chain of survival that we just talked about. So if any of these links are not, not activated or there's a delay, it could seriously harm your patient. So CPR prolongs period during which defib can be effective, has resuscitated patients with cardiac arrest from ventricular fibrillation or VFib. Non-traditional first responders are being trained in AED use. ALS and post-arrest care, continue ventilation, maintain oxygen saturation, sure blood pressure is more than 90, maintain glucose levels, rapid transport to appropriate hospital. So there's going to be a bunch of different things you're going to do once you get pulses back on a patient. You're probably going to run another 12 you. You're going to get some vital signs. You're going to continue to bag if the patient has uh, shallow or regular breathing. You're going to see if you kind of get a blood pressure up a little bit. You're going to check a glucose level. Integrating the AD and CPR. Work the AD and CPR in sequence. Do not touch a patient during analysis and defibrillation. CPR must stop while AED performs its job. AED maintenance. Maintain as manufacturer recommends. Read the operator's manual. Document AED failure. Check equipment daily at beginning of shift. Ask manufacturer for maintenance checklist. So always turn on your AED at the beginning of your shift. Make sure it's working properly. 
it most likely will tell you if it's out of batteries. You don't want to go to a call and have your AED not working. Report AED failures to manufacturer and U.S. Food and Drug Administration or FDA. Follow local protocol for notifying. So you're probably going to have to notify your supervisor. Replace your AED, get a new one. Medical direction should approve written protocol for AED use. Continuing education with skill com competency review is generally required for EMS providers. So emergency medical care for cardiac arrest, preparation, make sure the electricity injures no one. Do not try and defibrillate patients in pooled water. Do not defibrillate patients touching metal. Carefully remove nitroglycerin patch and wipe a dry towel before shocking. Shave hairy chest to increase conductivity. Determine the NOI and or MOI. Perform spinal mobilization for trauma patients. Call for ALS assistance in a tiered system. So well, this is kind of your, your table on what to do in a full arrest. Arrive on scene. Check responsiveness. Remember we've gone over this a couple days in a row. Okay, patient's not responding. Go ahead and get the AED. Tell us, call 911, request additional resources. Assess ABC simultaneously. So you're gonna check your pulse for at least five to 10 seconds. Open the airway, check and see if they're breathing. Okay, so no circulation, go ahead and begin chest compressions. Deliver at a rate of 100 to 120 minute. Do not provide ventilation until 30 compressions be given. Ratio 30 to two. Apply AD as soon as you can. Analyze and shock. After AD completes shock, begin CPR again. Remember, it's a critical fail if you don't uh, start CPR after your shock. Okay, and then after two minutes, you're gonna recheck the rhythm, or excuse me, you check your ABCs. Check and see if you got a pulse. Your AD is gonna reanalyze the rhythm. Okay, and then it's gonna tell you. Either a shock indicated, repeat last steps, continue CPR, or no shock advised, resume CPR. So if no shock advised, you're probably going to be in a systole or PA rhythm. Begin chest compressions and attach AED as soon as available with a witness cardiac arrest. Follow local protocol for patient care after AED use. After AED protocol is completed, one of the following is likely. Pulse regain. No pulse regain, no shock advice. No pulse regain and shock advice. So know what to do after you get pulses back. Or ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation. Wait for ALS and continue shocks and CPR on scene. If ALS is not responding, protocols agree, you begin transport when the patient regains a pulse. Six to nine shocks are delivered. AD gives three consecutive messages every two minutes of CPR advising no shock. So for our protocol, we do 20 minutes of CPR and four rounds of epinephrine. And then depending on what the, the rhythm is, we might be able to transport or we might pronounce on scene. Cardiac arrest during transport. Stop the vehicle. Begin CPR if AED is not immediately available. Call for ALS support. Analyze rhythm. Deliver shock if indicated and resume CPR. Continue resuscitation per local protocol. Coordination with ALS personnel. If AED is available, do not wait for ALS. Notify ALS of cardiac arrest. Do not delay defib. Follow local protocols for coordination. So management of return of spontaneous circulation. Monitor for respirations. Provide oxygen via BVM to 10 to 12 breaths a minute. Maintain oxygen saturation between 95 and 99. Assess blood pressure. See a patient can follow simple commands. Immediately begin transport if ALS is not en route per local protocol. Okay. So review. All the following are common signs and symptoms of cardiac ischemia. Except So A, cardiac ischemia occurs when the heart's demand for oxygen exceeds the available blood supply. 
Common signs and symptoms of cardiac ischemia include chest pain or discomfort, shortness of breath, and anxiety for or restlessness. So headache is not a common symptom of cardiac ischemia, but headache is a common side effect of nitroglycerin. So remember, after you give somebody nitroglycerin, they start complaining of a headache. That's going to be a side effect. Okay, what well, palpating the radial pulse of 56-year-old male? With chest pain, you know what the pulse's rate is 86 beats a minute and irregular. This indicates so remember, read the whole question. What are gonna be the key words in here that you're gonna be looking for? So D. An irregular pulse in a patient with a cardiac problem suggests dysrhythmia and abnormality in the heart's electrical conduction system. Patients with signs of cardiac compromise who have an irregular pulse must be monitored closely for cardiac arrest. So make sure you read the whole question. So irregular, his pulse rate. So that means they're probably gonna be an AFib. So that's gonna be what we call a dysrhythmia. 56-year-old man has an acute myocardial infarction, which of the following blood vessels became blocked and led to his condition. So B, the coronary arteries, which branch off the aorta, supply the myocardium muscle, heart muscle with oxygen-rich blood. Occlusion of one or more of these arteries results in cessation of oxygenated blood beyond the area of occlusion and results in acute myocardial infarction. So, so remember in the body, veins carry deoxygenated blood. Arteries carry oxygenated blood. And coronary is going to be your heart or your cardiovascular system. Pulmonary this is the only way it's turned around. So pulmonary veins uh, are the primary blood supply to the lungs and not the heart. So they're going to carry deoxygenated blood. Pulmonary arteries are going to carry, excuse me, pulmonary veins are going to carry oxygenated blood. Pulmonary arteries are going to carry deoxygenated blood. Major controllable risk factors for an AMI include So what are some things you guys could do to decrease your risk factors for being, for possibly having an, uh, a heart attack or an AMI? It's things that you can control, okay? So for some of us, we can't control being male. Uh, we also can't be contr controlled uh, being older once we start getting up there. And also we can't control our family history, remember? But we can't control cigarette smoking. We can stop smoking cigarettes. So it's going to be C. Smoking is a major controllable risk factor for any cardiovascular disease. So a patient with cardiac arrest secondary to V-fib has the greatest chance for survival if... So remember your five links. So C, survival from cardiac arrest secondary to V-fib is highest if CPR is provided immediately and defibrillation is provided within two minutes of the patient's cardiac arrest. Early high quality CPR and defibrillation are the two most important factors that influence survival from cardiac arrest. So this is why our dispatchers are also telling people now that they, we have to check a pulse for a patient when somebody's calling in for their family member or a bystander, can you check their pulse do they have a pulse okay just go ahead and start CPR try and get some blood flow going to the rest of their body and then once the medics arrive on scene they can throw the patches on and defib as soon as possible okay so a 59 year old woman presents with chest pressure she's conscious and alert but her skin is cool pale and clammy her first step in providing care treatment should be
So remember, when you guys are doing your NREMT, make sure you understand what the question is asking and what's you're gonna what's gonna be your first step. So you have your scene size up, you have your primary assessment, and you have your secondary assessment. What's gonna be the first thing when you come on scene? You have your general impression, right? Patient's conscious and alert, but her skin is cool, pale, and clammy. So which probably means she's she's not perfusing very well. The blood's shunting to her vital organs. So B, any patient with suspected cardiac compromise should be given oxygen as soon as possible. Obtaining vital signs and inquiring about the use of nitroglycerin are appropriate. However, you should administer oxygen first. The AD is only applied to the patients in cardiac arrest. So remember, airway, breathing, circulation, right? You got your general impression and then your ABCs. You want to fix that problem first. And then you go down your secondary assessment. You could ask her OPQRST, ask her if she's taking any medication, ask for a set of vital signs for your partner. If a patient with the implanted pacemaker is in cardiac arrest, the EMT should So you're not going to avoid defibrillation, right? Most likely the your medical control is going to allow you to place the, the AED on a patient unless they have a DNR or a pulsed. And you're not going to apply the AED pads directly over the implanted pacemaker. You're going to place the AED pads away from the pacemaker. So the only, only modification required for cardiac arrest patients with an implanted pacemaker is to ensure that the AED pads are away from the pacemaker. Placing the AED pads directly over the pacemaker will result in a less effective defibrillation and may damage the pacemaker. The main advantage of the AED is Do you guys think that all these answers are correct? So D, the AD provides quick delivery of a shock, is easier to perform than CPR and does not require ALS providers to operate it. So it does provide a quick delivery of shock. AD uh, analyzes the rhythm as soon as you put it on. It's easier than performing CPR. CPR is a very physical exercise. All you have to do is turn on the AED, put on some patches, and, and I'll tell you what to do next. And there's no need for ALS providers to be on scene. Any bystander or layperson can do it. After administering a nitroglycerin tablet to a patient, the EMT should... So after you administer a nitroglycerin tablet to a patient... You're not going to check the expiration date because that should have been done before you give it to somebody. You're not going to tell the patient to chew the tablet because it's going to be sublingually. It's going to dissolve under the tongue. Ensure that the nitroglycerin is prescribed to the patient. You're going to do that before you give the patient uh, any medication, remember? So it's going to be B. Nitroglycerin is vasodilated and can lower the patient's BP. Therefore, you should reassess the patient's BP within five Minutes after giving nitro, instruct the patient to allow the nitroglycerin to dissolve under his or her tongue. It should not be chewed. You should check the drug's expiration date and ensure that it's prescribed to the patient before administering it. So nitroglycerin is contraindicated in patients with... So just because the patient's having chest pain that's going on for more than 30 minutes, you're still going to try and relieve some of that pain if you can. And it's not contraindicated with any antibiotics that the patient might be taking. And even a patient is younger than 40 years of age and have diabetes, it's not contraindicated. You could still give someone nitroglycerin that's under 40. People would still have heart attacks under 40. It's it's rare, but in some circumstances it does happen. But you're not going to give 
nitroglycerin is somebody with a systolic blood pressure of less than 100. So, A, nitroglycerin is vasodilator may cause a drop in blood pressure. Therefore, it is contraindicated in patients with a systolic BP of less than 100 and in patients who have taken erectile dysfunction ED drugs within the past 24 to 48 hours. ED drugs are also vasodilators. If given in combination with nitroglycerin, severe hypotension may occur.